Hello, welcome everyone uh, to the AFS webinar on therapeutic management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Tonight is part of an ongoing series of webinars highlighting areas of focus within foregut. If you would like to catch up on previous webinars, you can go to AmericanForeGutSociety.org or on Twitter at Foregut Society. Uh, members can also seek out these webinars on Facebook. Future topics are going to cover gastroparesis, um, achalasia, and other such topics um, of relevance. Uh, without further delay, I'd like to move on to our panelists tonight. We have an all-star lineup. We're very lucky tonight to have Dr. Ken Chang from UCI, Dr. John Lippum from USC, and Dr. Jessica Reynolds from Eastside Medical Center. Uh, tonight, we'll be discussing uh, therapeutic management of GERD. This is the part two of the series, part one previously discussed uh, medical management lifestyle modifications. Uh, if you wanna check that out, out, you can go see some of the other, um, of those webinars at the website or on Twitter or Facebook, as I mentioned. So the format tonight, each panelist is going to speak for a little over 10 minutes. And then after all three um, have had their chance, we're gonna open it up for questions in the chat. So you can hold your questions till then, and then we'll try and get to as many as possible. We will be aiming to run just about an hour. And without further uh, delay, Dr. Cheng, take it away. You'll be discussing TIP. Thank you, Kristen. I'm gonna share a screen. Okay, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Okay, so it's great. Uh, you know, I get to say whatever I say, and then John comes on and corrects me, and then Jessica comes on and tells us all the truth. So thank you for having me. So the title is Therapeutic Management of GERD, TIF, and CTIF, all in 12 minutes. Here we go. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, the key points, so you just have to remember three things, and I'll repeat them at the end. Uh, there are many GERD patients who are refractory to PPI, and they are uh, appropriate candidates for anti-reflux procedures, but are not receiving them, uh, either surgery or procedures. And that's uh, one important uh, fact to keep in mind. Uh, and therefore, we as gastroenterologists and surgeons really need to work together as a team. And I'll uh, elaborate on this theme of working together. Uh, and also, point number three, there are many, many good options for anti-reflux surgery and procedures, including endoscopic therapy, either alone or in combination with surgery. And the personalized approach uh, to the GERD patients includes a thorough understanding of the anatomic alterations and individualizing the strategy and approach to the treatment. So these are my key points that, uh, that I wanna highlight uh, so point number one, regarding uh, more or less the, uh, the number of procedures that are being done and the number of unmet need in patients with refractory GERD. So this publication showed from 2005 to 2010, the number of anti-reflux surgeries was pretty flat, less than 20,000 a year uh, with no change at all uh, over the, the review period, which was five years. Um, either laparoscopic or total procedures. This more recent uh, paper surveyed 71,000 uh, patients. Uh, and in this paper, what, what was very interesting is that 40% of US adults have GERD symptoms and a little bit of back of the envelope type numbers that represents about 80 million people. 35% um, uh, of GERD patients are on chronic medications. That represents 28 million people. 55% of them are on PPIs. That represents 15.4 million people. 68% uh, of PPI users take it on a daily basis. That's 10.5 million. And 54% of people uh, uh, using daily PPI are refractory uh, to daily PPI, meaning that they have persistent troublesome symptoms greater than two days out of the week. And that represents uh, 5.6 million people. So then if we look at the 20,000 anti-reflux procedures that are done uh, relative to the 5.6 million people who are refractory to PPI, we've got a, a less than 0.4% uh, 
of those people who could benefit from a procedure not having it. So we've got a lot of work to do um, to, to, to even get near this unmet need. Uh, now, if you look at the bariatric story, uh, we see a little bit of a difference. Uh, this trend from 1990 to 2002 shows that the number of bariatric procedures has uh, climbed considerably despite a pretty flat uh, anti-reflux uh, procedure. Um, and the question is why? Uh, what, what made this uh, differential in terms of uptake and growth? Uh, so I think it, it really uh, starts with the changes in the obesity conversation and moving the pendulum. You know, for a long time, we were all involved and heard a lot about this uh, internal argument, which surgical procedure is better. And while that's interesting, it wasn't useful because it was merely moving the same furniture around the same room. But if we really want to get more furniture into the house, we have to ask the broader question, and that is, how do we provide more effective therapy to more patients and thereby bring more furniture appropriately into the house? So if you take that conversation to GERD, you know, we spent a lot of time saying, well, my Nissan is better than your toupee and better than your Watson. But that's really arguing amongst ourselves and merely shuffling the furniture around the same room. Uh, what we need to ask is, how do we bring more effective therapy to more patients? Uh, same kind of paradigm uh, with the obesity procedures. And so that, that has been kind of uh, our mantra in, in AFS is, how do we, how do we uh, meet this unmet need and, and take care of more patients who would benefit? Um, so anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. And you know, I've learned a lot from John Lippum listening to his talks over years and, and many others, um, as a gastroenterologist, you know, there's only, only one valve to think about and that's the LES, but we forget about the hernia and we forget about more importantly, the cruise. So uh, I've learned that there's really three important components to always think about in a GERD patient, the LES, the height of the hernia, and what we forget about is the crura and the, the, uh, the, the width of the diaphragmatic opening or hiatus, even uh, in the absence of a vertical hernia. Uh, the, the cura is crucial, uh, even without a hernia to the anti-reflux barrier. And there've been a lot of recent elegant studies looking at the function and how dynamic this right cruise is, is in, in creating a, uh, a change in the angle of the GE junction uh, to reflect more of this kind of an anatomy. This is a barostat balloon uh, placed across the G junction. And this near right angle uh, hockey stick turn, uh, which is a great anti-reflux barrier, is produced uh, by the right cruise, uh, which is pulling posterior to the right and inferiorly uh, in a normal patient. And dynamically, uh, this is in coordination with the uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, this barostat is placed in, in a patient without a hernia, but has an open hiatus. The cruise is loose, and now you've gotten a flattening of that angle and uh, the uh, opportunity for that uh, G junction to slide up and down. During an endoscopy, you don't see a hernia, but you're looking for the telltale signs of an open diaphragmatic hiatus. And then, of course, this uh, situation where there's a vertical hernia which can be seen on an upper GI or on endoscopy. But it's this middle category that we are just learning to appreciate how important it is to recognize this phenotype. So on endoscopy, uh, we're fooled a lot. Uh, this is obviously looking at the LES and it looks uh, pretty intact. Uh, you don't see an obvious hernia. Uh, you, you do a retroflex and you're looking at the bottom of the LES. This is the flat valve. And that looks fairly intact. Uh, is there is the is the cruise is the diaphragm intact or not? Uh, you know, we want to challenge that a little bit by uh, inflating uh, up to 45 seconds, 60 seconds, and and even sometimes there it doesn't really open up for us. But in this patient, uh, you know, I went down to the duodenum and I came back and I and I went back into the esophagus, and the anatomy changed even within like 60 seconds. Because here I'm looking now at the, the diaphragmatic pinch and it's lower than it was before. 
these are gastric folds. The LAS is now up higher. The diaphragmatic pinch is lower. And suddenly this patient is declaring himself to have a sliding hernia and an open hiatus. Here we can see now in the same patient, same session, the retroflex view looks like a completely different patient, different anatomy. And now we can see uh, the opening of the diaphragmatic hiatus. This is uh, a hill grade three. Uh, and so uh, if that patient went to surgery and this is the same patient at the time of laparoscopy, you can see a very open hiatus. And this is the cruise, the right cruise uh, enveloping the G junction. Uh, so this is something that we're learning about. We're underappreciating and under assessing. So that's the open hiatus on endoscopy and that's the open hiatus on laparoscopy. So working together with our surgical colleagues, we're learning a lot about the anatomy of GERD and for the surgeons to always appreciate the endoscopic uh, view as well. I think there's a great uh, exchange there. Um, so the LES uh, has been the mainstay of, of anti-reflux uh, attention and we're even learning more about the LES because the LES is actually a misnomer. It's not really the lower esophageal sphincter because the gastric sling fibers are continuous uh, with the uh, circular uh, muscle of the distal esophagus, which compose the LES. So these sling fibers uh, are contiguous uh, with, the, with the circular muscle and they extend into the cardia and they're attached here at the greater curve. So when this muscle uh, can contracts, it actually swings the greater curve flat valve towards the lesser curve backstop. Uh, and that is an important mechanism of the anti-reflux barrier, which is a dynamic uh, flat valve mechanism uh, shown here with the red arrow. Now, if you look on the right, uh, this is a fairly normal flat valve. Uh, th these are the sling fibers that create this impression of this omega looking uh, lip. Um, and if I were to superimpose the, uh, the, the sling fiber muscles in purple, that's what it would look like. So uh, to orient this even better, I can flip the image around for you. And, and then you can see that the, the uh, sling fibers here are, are oriented in the same way of the diagram. And when the sling fibers contract, they're going to swing the flat valve from that greater curve towards that lesser curve backstop. And, and so when we talk about anti-reflux procedures, including endoscopic approaches, we want to restore this component of the flap valve as much as we want to reduce the hernia, as much as we want to tighten the crural diaphragm. The third component is restoring this flap valve. Uh, so the, this is a, this, uh, a flap valve that's completely gone. And this is a flap valve that's restored. It has length, it's narrowed and it's floppy and it closes uh, towards that lesser curve. So when we uh, look at uh, an endoscopic approaches to uh, recreating the flap valve, uh, we see here that the flap valve is uh, shortened. The angle of, of hiss is also um, widened. And this is what we're looking at. This uh, angle of hiss, this cardia notch uh, is shallow. Uh, and so when we want to reconstruct a nice flap valve, and this is uh, what it looks like after a TIF procedure, uh, this is what we can produce uh, endoscopically or laparoscopically. Uh, we create this very steep angle of hiss. The cardiac notch is steep uh, and deep. And uh, these, uh, the circular fibers and sling fibers are back in continuity, creating this length and the floppiness of being able to swing from the greater curve towards the lesser curve. So the functional, uh, functional and anatomic uh, assessment includes the uh, EGD, looking at the LES and flap valve, looking at the length of hernia, the hill grade, the presence of esophagitis, uh, a pH study, uh, manometry on select patients, as well as endo, uh, endo flip on some patients. And then, then we talk about the, uh, the procedural options. Uh, first and foremost, I always ask, is there a hernia to repair? Is there a cura that needs to be repaired? If so, then that automatically goes to a foregut surgeon because we cannot touch this uh, endoscopically. So a careful assessment, and I, say, I would say that the vast majority of our patients 
need some sort of hernia repair. And then in terms of uh, uh, once you have the hernia repair uh, established, then there's a number of options, great options for reconstructing the LES and flap valve, a Nissen, a partial fundo, Lynx, TIF. Uh, now there are some certain cases where a gastrogastric plication is, uh, is reasonable and I'll go over that. And we have a mucosal ablation and suturing procedure called maze. We have resection and plication called RAP and, uh, and GERD-X. And then there are uh, procedures that near, uh, merely decrease the compliance of the sling fibers. And I would put strata in that category as well as the anti-reflux mucosectomy or ARMS. So this is the TIF device. Uh, this has gone through iterations. And the goal of the TIF device is to create this flap valve. Uh, helical retractors are used to retract on the G junction, creating a length of three to four centimeters. Uh, and that's then, uh, then it's combined with a wrap that's 270 to 300 degrees. And at, at the end of this procedure, you're creating uh, and tightening the entire LES construct, uh, the esophageal component, as well as the gastric uh, flap valve component. Um, obviously, there are other options. There's the fundoplication, which you'll hear about. There's the links, which you'll hear about. Uh, but a very popular emerging combination is to do the hernia repair plus the TIF in one procedure. And this is an example of uh, Nin Nguyen and I doing a case. This is pre-hernia repair. You can see the large open hiatus. Uh, and you can see on laparoscopy, the open hiatus. Um, this is after the hernia repair. It looks beautiful, uh, but there's no flap valve yet. And that's where we can come in and it could be done by the same surgeon or in, in partnership with your uh, gastroenterology colleague, uh, we, we can do a tag team approach and, and create this uh, combined or C-TIF. Uh, this is the valve after the TIF. Um, and so this can be done as a combination strategy. Uh, there's lots of published data on TIF alone and CTIF, uh, and the data looks fairly comparable to traditional anti-reflux surgery, and a prospective randomized trial is underway. Uh, so there are some home run indications for endoscopic GERD therapy uh, alone, and that would include after a POEM procedure, if the patient doesn't need a hernia repair, you can do a TIF alone, and this has been a great salvage in the small percentage of patients who need anti-reflux procedure after a POEM procedure with achalasia. Um, patients after esophagectomy have uh, limited options for anti-reflux, and that's where the maze and wrap procedure we found has been very helpful. Uh, after a sleeve procedure uh, and patients suffer with GERD, a lynx is a great option. Uh, endoscopic options include maze wrap and arms. And after a failed fundal plication, which I'm sure never happens with John's cases, but in case it ever happens uh, and there's no hernia repair that needs to be done, then TIF is a reasonable salvage. And we have a publication out now for failed fundo and uh, TIF as a rescue uh, procedure. So again, uh, the summary key points, lots of patients who need anti-reflux surgery and procedures not, not getting them. We need to work together as a team. And there are many good options uh, and working together to look at the best option for the patient will increase the number of patients who get to an anti-reflux uh, solution. And obviously the personalized approach includes a thorough understanding of the anatomic alterations. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Dr. Cheng, thank you. That was a tour de force, um, impressive. Uh, picking up from here, we're gonna go with uh, Dr. Lipham. So Ken's got to stop sharing his screen before I can show you my family videos. Ah, there we go. All right, now I can share my screen, I hope. So hopefully you can see that, nod or wink at me if you can. Uh, looks great. All right. 
All right, so I was tapped to talk about fund application uh, for the treatment of reflux. Um, so I'm going to try to keep it to that topic. Um, the usual disclosures, and I'm going to do it hopefully in 12 minutes or more. Um, I was going to say less, but realistically, I probably could just talk about the disclosures for 12 minutes. So um, as Ken already outlined, I don't need to to belabor this too much, but you know, obviously GERD is a mechanical problem. Uh, we all know it, but as Ken said, for decades, it's been all about the lower esophageal sphincter. So just as a very quick reminder of what Ken just told you, um, or news to some that weren't paying attention, you know, the barrier to reflux is more than the LES, um, clearly. Um, you know, water is still wet, and there's more to this story than just the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, the integrity of the crura, as it turns out, probably contributes at least 50% to that barrier. Um, in fact, I'll show you a publication that just came out recently um, from the Cornell group that looked at what really constituted the barrier or what contributed most to a new barrier when we went in there surgically to fix it. So what they did in this uh, incredible publication, which was presented at the American Surgical and later published in the Annals of Surgery, is they used the endoflip device at various stages of the surgery when they were fixing a hiatal hernia and then either doing a Nissen fund application or a partial fund application or even links. So they used endoflip to see what was contributing to that newly reconstructed barrier. And what they found was uh, really quite surprising. Um, what they found when they looked at endoflip is that the hiatal hernia repair in and of itself contributed the majority of that change in the EGJ barrier. They looked at distensibility index specifically and they found that about 80% of that new barrier was due to us fixing that hiatal hernia. About 60% of the increased length of the barrier was due to that hiatal hernia repair. What was also interesting was they really didn't find any difference between Nissen fund application, a partial fund application, or links. They were all pretty equal, which kind of makes sense if you think about it. If the hernia repair is a, amounting to 80% of the procedure, it clearly means we don't have to do much to the LES to stop reflux. So at the end of the day, what they concluded was that the hiatal hernia repair accounted for 80% of that newly reconstructed barrier. And so why is this important? Well, it's important because in order to treat this disease, we got to remember that there are two parts to this story, um, that the barrier is both, as Ken said, the LES and the cura. So part one of the story has to be fixing that hiatal hernia. Again, it may account for up to 80% of this newly reconstructed barrier. We've got to restore the integrity of that cura. Um, I will also argue, and I don't have time to argue in this presentation, but it's also our Achilles heel to any of these anti-reflux procedures we're going to talk about. You know, the wraps really don't come undone. The links doesn't fall apart. What happens is the hiatal hernias come back. And that's why the patient gets recurrent reflux. Part two of the story is well to fix the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, it only accounts for 20 to 50% of the barrier, but nevertheless, we've got to fix it if we want to fully restore that barrier. So starting with part one, um, it's the age old question, does size matter? Does the size of the hiatal hernia here matter? And I would argue, no, the size of the hernia really doesn't matter. Because again, I will argue that the cura are defective in all patients with reflux, and especially in patients with a hiatal hernia. You know, the reason the hiatal hernia forms is because the cura are defective. And as the cura deteriorate, the hiatal hernia becomes bigger and the reflux becomes worse. And so at some point in this story, that patient will have lost 50 to 80% of that barrier that is supposed to be protecting them against reflux. Now the question then is, well, do we need to use mesh when we're fixing these hernias? Well, that in and of itself is at least an hour debate. And so I've elected not to get into that part of this tonight. Now, part two of the story is fixing the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, now, assuming we fix the hiatal hernia, we've, as Ken said, we've got a lot of options from Nissen fund application to partial fund applications to TIF and CTIF um, to links. But at the end of the day, it may surprise you, but I'll argue that all of these are pretty darn equal. 
Um, and it may be due to the fact that 80% of this is due to us fixing the hiatal hernia. At the end of the day, I'll tell you that all these procedures are equally efficacious in stopping reflux. And so it then begs the question, well, then how do I choose? How do I choose between TIF and Nissen and partial and links? Well, if I had the ability to poll the audience right now, which I don't, I'm sure the answers that I would get would be, well, I, you know, I choose, I, I tailor it based on manometry um, to try to prevent dysphagia. Well, no, I choose it because this one clearly is more efficacious or I try to balance the side effects or I choose based on severity of disease. Well, I think if I was to answer this question, I would answer it with probably C and D to balance the side effects and as well as the severity of the disease. The question of predicting postoperative dysphagia, well, I will tell you that this has been looked at ad nauseum. And if we want the Cliff Notes version of this, manometry has not been able to predict dysphagia in these patients. This right here is a study from a number of years ago that looked at that very question. Is there any parameters on manometry that I can look at that are going to tell me, hey, that patient is going to have trouble with dysphagia post-op? They looked at 74 patients. Uh, they all got Nissen fund application. They all got the normal workup, including manometry. Um, and they looked to see if there was anything they could identify to predict post-op dysphagia. Well, at the end of the day, there wasn't anything. There wasn't a single characteristic on manometry um, that would allow them to predict which patients would struggle with post-op dysphagia. The only thing that predicted post-op dysphagia was pre-op dysphagia. And so this idea of tailoring the operation is really not founded in a lot of science, I will tell you that. This right here is a randomized controlled trial that was done about 12 years ago, um, looking at that very question. Do I benefit anybody by tailoring this operation? So it was a randomized controlled trial. They did preoperative manometry on all their patients. They then categorized them into either effective motility or ineffective motility. They went ahead and then randomized them to getting a Nissen or a Toupe fund application, irregardless of their manometry status. At one year after the procedure, um, they looked at the Nissen versus the Toupe. They found that there was no difference in control of reflux symptoms, no difference in heartburn, regurgitation, or other GERD symptoms. The Nissen did have a higher rate of postoperative dysphagia as well as chest pain, but when they looked at the ineffective versus effective motility group, there was no difference in the post-op dysphagia rates. And so there's really no reason, at least based in science, to tailor the degree of fund application. And so for me, it boils down to really balancing the side effect profile as well as, I guess, the efficacy based on the severity of disease. So the other age-old question has been, well, is Nissen any better than partial fund application? And we could spend probably three days going through all the literature that has compared Nissen to partial fund application. But luckily, somebody has done a lot of the work for us um, in this meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, looking at Nissen versus partial fund application. So they looked at 29 randomized control trials, almost 2,000 patients, comparing Nissen to various different types of partial fund application. And what they found should be no surprise, if you were listening at the beginning of my talk, all the procedures were pretty darn equal in efficacy in controlling reflux symptoms. They all had very similar morbidity and reoperation rates. Um, the Nissen did have slightly more dysphagia than the partial fund applications, but really where the partial fund application shined was in the other side effects, meaning the gas and the bloating. This is where the partial fund application really had a superior benefit over Nissen fund application. And so that really begs the question, you know, does partial fund application really have less gas issues? And to ideally answer this question, we need a dedicated study that looks solely at flatulence associated with any of our procedures to treat reflux. So knowing that I was gonna be giving this webinar, this talk tonight, I really scoured the literature looking for information data to support anything here. 
I mean, I went to all the major textbooks that looked at flatulence. I went to some very famous people I knew that had issues with flatulence to see if I could get their advice. I even went to the internet. I mean, we all do it. Dr. Google is, is king here. And I went to the internet and found what I thought was a fairly reliable website that had a whole article just dedicated to flatulence. Uh, it turns out it was only one subset, apparently some hot flatulence of some sort. So that didn't help. But then I stumbled across this publication right here um, from David Watson's group from Australia. It came out just a couple of years ago called the Flatulence After Anti-Reflux Treatment Study. It was the FART study. It's exactly what I was looking for. And it wasn't a small study. It was 265 patients, 11-year median follow-up. And they looked at specifically the gas issues associated with Nissen versus the various partial fundiplications. And what they found should really be no surprise to most of the people on this webinar, but the Nissen fundiplication had three times more flatulence than the partial fundiplications. Now, I have no idea how they measure that, if they have some sort of special device they send you home with to capture it, but nevertheless, they concluded three times more flatulence associated with Nissen. The one that really shined, the one that really had the least amount of gas issues was a 180 degree partial fundiplication, which they coined the Watson fundiplication that Ken referred to earlier. If you're not familiar with a Watson fundiplication, think of it this way. It's very similar to a TIF procedure, but done surgically. It's an anterior 180 degree partial fundiplication. And that's what's represented here on the screen with these two pictures. This is the intraoperative photo, obviously, where we bring that stomach 180 degrees or more around the anterior esophagus. The endoscopic picture below is what the valve, uh, or nipple valve, funnel valve looks like immediately after. And again, looks very similar in my mind to a TIF. This right here is a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials that have looked at the Watson fund application compared to Nissen. They looked at both the one and the five-year results of a Watson fund application. What they found at one year was, again, the two procedures were very similar in reflux control, but the partial fund application had much lower incidence of dysphagia as well as gas, bloat, and flatulence. Um, the five-year results were also very similar. Um, the Nissen and partial had very similar outcomes as far as control or reflux, but again, much less dysphagia, gas, and bloat. And so that would lead me to conclude and many to conclude that, well, maybe the Nissen fund application is dead. Well, I'm here to tell you, at least based on very limited and very old data, that I don't think the Nissen is completely dead. Um, I think the Nissen does have a role and it has a role in severe disease. It's been my experience, I can tell you working with Lynx, that this is one group that doesn't really do well with Lynx and probably doesn't do well with partial fund application. And these are the patients that I would categorize as having severe reflux problems. These are the patients with LA grade C and D esophagitis, long segment Barrett's, and maybe even higher pH scores. Now, speaking of old, this publication right here from Reg Bell, I'm just kidding, Reg, um, came out in 1999 that looked at that very question, is a partial fund application good for patients with severe reflux? And what Reg concluded in this publication was it really wasn't. A two-pay fund application did not do well in patients with really severe reflux. And he defined severe reflux as having a defective lower esophageal sphincter by length as well as pressure, as well as having very complicated or high grades of esophagitis. If you tried to do a partial on that group, success rate was around 50% compared to 96% with patients with mild disease. But nevertheless, old data is still data. Um, this publication also from 1999 from Blair Job and Lee Swanstrom, um, again, looked at that very topic, small study, 48 patients, but they all got to pay fund application, mean follow-up was almost two years. And they looked at predictors for failure of partial fund application. And the predictors for failure really aren't rocket sciences. Most of us probably would have guessed it. It's patients with defective lower esophageal sphincters by length and pressure, long segment Barrett's, severe esophagitis, stricture, and high Demeester scores. What they found in this publication is patients with Demeester scores of over 50 
had a much higher failure rate with partial fund application. In fact, the patients with Demetra scores over 50, there was 86% probability um, that their procedures would fail. And so at the end of the day, I think I've used up my 12 minutes or 13 or 14 or however many Kirsten allowed me, some weird number. Um, GERD barrier is obviously both the Cura and the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, the repairs that we have, like I said, we've got a lot of good options these days. We're in a good place. Um, I agree with Ken, I think they're all pretty equal. Uh, I like the idea of moving more furniture into the house as opposed to just rearranging the deck chairs. Um, the Nissen, I think, does have a place and its place is severe disease. Keep that in mind. I think you're gonna be not as happy with doing a lynx or a partial fundoplication or a TIF on some of these really bad refluxers. Uh, mesh is an hour debate. Maybe we can do that a different day. Uh, to me, the focus of research, what we really need to look at now uh, is better ways to repair the hiatal hernia so we don't have such a high recurrence rate. Anyway, that's all I've got. I'm gonna yield the floor, so to speak, to Jessica. Um, thank you for allowing me to babble. Dr. Lipoma is always very informative and entertaining. Thank you so much. Uh, and moving on to round us out will be Dr. Reynolds talking about uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation. All right. So um, Dr. Chang and Dr. Lipum did a great job uh, talking about the uh, sphincter and the diaphragm and talking about patient selection. And so luckily I can just jump right into talking about magnetic sphincter augmentation, which is another great surgical option for the treatment of GERD. Um, and my disclosure, I do do professional education for Johnson & Johnson Ethicon. Um, so magnetic sphincter augmentation, of course, has been out for about 10 years with over 30,000 devices implanted to date. And it involves placing a ring of magnetic beads loosely around the lower esophageal sphincter to augment its function. Just like the native sphincter, it works best when it's co-localized with the diaphragm. And so a hiatal hernia repair and chloroplasty is usually performed at the same time, just like a fund application. So in, in the past 10 years, there have been a ton of studies that have shown MSA to be safe and effective in terms of symptom scores and normalization of pH with efficacy comparable to fund application. Now, a lot of those studies have been short term, one to two years. However, there is a five year study that um, did show that over five years, uh, symptom improvement is stable. Uh, and that also the uh, uh, side effects remains low over five years. And then also there uh, in 2019, there was actually a randomized controlled trial looking at MSA versus double dose PPI. And you can see that MSA outperformed double dose PPIs in terms of uh, percent of patients who had relief from regurgitation, improvement in GERD HRQL scores, and satisfaction with their condition. Also in the percent of patients who had no regurgitation. And then on objective studies, you can see MSA outperformed PPIs in terms of the uh, having normal reflux episodes, normal Demeester score, and a normal percent time pH. So the, the side effects common amongst all anti-reflux procedures are of course gas blow and dysphagia. And in 2017, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis that showed really the main difference between uh, MSA and fund application is that there does seem to be less gas bloat with MSA um, and comparable amounts of dysphagia. And um, this can be important because a lot of patients, you know, do hesitate to get surgery because of what they've heard about gas bloat, whether it's necessarily true or not. So, um, talking about choosing the patient, so it's really important. Um, when to have good outcomes for anti-reflux surgery that we tailor our approach to the patient or how do we pick a patient, the right patient for the surgery. 
And um, you know, Dr. Chang did great explaining this, and so did Dr. Lipom. And I kind of think of the same thing where I'm thinking, how much symptom improvement am I going to get compared to the likelihood of side effects? So for example, Karen, who's on twice a day PPIs and an H2 blocker and still has to take Tums and still has GERD symptoms that are lifestyle limiting is going to tolerate some food sticking symptoms way better than Dave, whose symptoms are totally controlled on a daily PPI, but just wants a links because he's heard PPIs are bad for you. So, um, you know, it's, I always think about maximizing that change in pre-op symptoms while minimizing side effects with the procedure that uh, I choose for a patient. And, you know, of course the, the worst outcome is when you don't improve their symptoms at all and give them side effects uh, because you may be treating the wrong uh, disease uh, and maybe treating a functional or motility disorder masquerading as GERD. So uh, Dr. Buckley did a review article in 2019 where he uh, nicely stated the optimal MSA population may be the 2% of GERD patients who, despite optimal medical management, continue experiencing symptoms of heartburn and or uncontrolled regurgitation, have normal pH, abnormal pH, and have intact esophageal function as determined by high resolution manometry. I think this statement really, again, is just going towards finding those patients that are gonna get a big symptom improvement and have minimal side effects. So, and of course, MSA has been shown to be safe and effective in other populations as well, such as those with large parasophageal hernias, those with ineffective esophageal motility, and in patients who have GERD after bariatric surgery. So the, the main thing here is to work up the patients appropriately so that you can determine which surgery is gonna be best for them. So for MSA, the pre-op requirements, some objective evidence of GERD, so ideally a pH study, high-grade esophagitis, Barrett's, and evidence of intact esophageal motility, whether that's in upper GI with a solid phase, such as a marshmallow bagel study or manometry. And they should not have an allergy to titanium, stainless steel, nickel, or ferrous metals. Um, it's a really important to screen if you're considering MSA in your patients, you should be careful to screen them for health-related anxiety or visceral hypersensitivity. Um, these are patients who are, um, they obsess over their bodily functions, um, in physical discomfort. They often present as finding the Bravo excruciatingly painful. Um, they seem to have pain from normal bodily functions. They may have other diagnoses such as sensitive esophagus, functional dyspepsia, irritable bowel syndrome, biliary dyskinesia, and fibromyalgia. And uh, these patients just don't seem to do well with uh, MSA. Um, the device seems to be a point that they can focus on and they can be very difficult to manage um, after surgery. And, and it's important to have a good discussion with them if you're considering it. Um, I, also equally important is patient education. So MSA does have uh, some unique post-operative requirements, I think, that patients need to know about and need to know what they need to do as well as what to expect. So they're going to have some dysphagia and they, they need to know about that and they need to know how to manage it with their diet, um, exercising the device so that the, the capsule can form appropriately, knowing that they have to eat every one to two hours, expecting that honeymoon period. Um, and also knowing that they may have esophageal spasms and you know, also telling patients that they, they may have bloating. Um, it may not be as severe with some other procedures, but it's very normal to feel a little more bloated than they did before surgery now that they have a normal functioning valve. Um, and this was really brought home to me when I, I had a patient who was uh, requiring Lynx removal um, done at another 
institution. And when she came in, she stated, I asked her if she had been doing her hourly eating. And she said that no one had told her and she works in a factory, you know, where they aren't allowed to take breaks and they can't have food on the line. And there was no way she could possibly do that. And if she had known she had to do that, she wouldn't have chosen MSA. So when doing the procedure, um, you know, the hiatal hernia repair, as we talked about, is, is a separate thing that, um, you know, it has to be done uh, appropriately. And you should always do a hi hiatal dissection to ensure there is not a small hiatal hernia and that you're placing the links in the appropriate place. Uh, you want to do adequate dissection to get sufficient esophageal length, have a snug hiatal closure and minimize tension on the closure. Make sure you're clearing off any lipomy lipomas or hernia sacs from the GE junction so that the lynx is sized appropriately. And you really want to measure it to sit more like a necklace than a choker so that there's really kind of a gap uh, on all sides and it just sits loosely around it. And I always kind of explain to patients, you know, it's not squeezing your esophagus closed. It's just kind of sitting there loosely waiting for the esophagus to open inappropriately and prevent that. There we go. So what happens when there's, what kind of problems can you have after surgery? So most are just the typical post-op symptoms. So these are dysphagia and esophageal spasms. The dysphagia generally starts seven to 10 days after surgery and can last anywhere from a few days to a few months, um, but usually a week or so. Um, if patients have any signs of dysphagia at all, any food sticking, start steroids right away. Um, this will help with some of the inflammation and scar tissue formation. You can do a medrol dose pack, um, 50 milligrams a day for five to 10 days, uh, one milligram per kilogram a day for five to 10 days. Um, but you definitely wanna get steroids started and you can repeat that you know, several times throughout the patient's post-operative course if they're getting benefit from it. A lot of times patients do require more than one course of steroids. They'll feel better during it. And then when they stop the steroids, they may start to feel um, like the food sticking or dysphagia comes back a little bit and require another round. Um, esophageal spasms uh, can be really concerning to patients, of course, because they feel like a heart attack. So letting them know about it beforehand is good. And then also lots of reassurance that it's gonna get better. And then avoiding cold foods or liquids, steroids again, and then Valium 10 milligrams three times a day can also be really helpful as well as, and then also things like sublingual nitroglycerin, lepsin, baclofen, and also peppermint can help if all else fails. Uh, for patients whose dysphagia does not get better, and now you're, you know, three, four months out, um, an upper GI is always appropriate to make sure there's no signs of pseudoachalasia. Um, if there does appear to be pseudoachalasia, the device should be removed. Um, dilation, so a balloon dilation, uh, with or without fluoro, but I would notice that the open diameter with tissue is two to three centimeters. So using a 15 millimeter balloon is probably not going to be enough dilation to make a difference. Um, and I think most people would use a three cent, a two to three centimeter balloon and consider pneumatic dilation to really get good opening of those beads and um, break up the scar tissue. Uh, you want to make sure you give steroids right after so that they don't just reform the scar tissue. Um, and you can repeat that, you know, depending on patient preference. Um, some patients will want multiple dilations, although there does seem to be decreasing returns after um, two dilations. Um, so some patients, though, they get through that first dilation and they really don't want another one. Um, and I would say if the patient is miserable, take it out. Uh, it's important to check the device size to ensure that the size of the device that was put in to make sure that all the beads are removed and that none of them have been inadvertently left behind. 
Uh, overall, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. Once you open the capsule, generally the beads are right there. They usually are individually encapsulated, but once you open it up, you can kind of grab one and then just start opening the capsule on the interior aspect of the beads. The beads uh, do not conduct the um, electric current. So you can uh, bobby right on them. And then once they're all freed, you can undo the clasp or cut the wire and pull it out. Uh, if patients are having it out for dysphagia, they generally do not need um, another anti-reflux surgery, or they, I should say they do not necessarily need another anti-reflux surgery. Uh, a lot of patients may do fine without one and have their symptoms controlled. Um, if they're having a recurrent GERD, of course, that's another story. Um, current removal rates are trending um, around 5 6 um, percent, um, up to 10 percent. Uh, erosion, so um, the this study from 2012 looked at the MAUD database for all in sorry, not from 2012, this one looked at all implanted devices from 2007 to 2017 with uh, 9,000 devices and there are 29 erosions. And that was a 0.3% risk at three years. And most of those occurred in the first, uh, in years two and three with an estimated rate of erosion of 0.1 to 0.3%. And if you just comparatively, that's 10 times less than what was seen with the angel chick or a lap band. Um, so erosions are uh, pretty rare. And again, they don't seem to increase as time goes on. And uh, a lot of uh, the initial erosions were related. You can see here that 5% of the, uh, sorry, the majority of the erosions occurred with the size 12 device, which is not in use anymore and was probably due to too tight sizing of the device. Um, and uh, likely there will continue to be a decrease in erosions. So in conclusion, patient selection and education is gonna be one of the most important things for successful anti-reflux surgery, regardless of the procedure you're doing. Uh, you want to maximize the difference between change in symptoms and the development of side effects. Uh, use steroids liberally for any postoperative dysphagia or esophageal spasms. If you have persistent dysphagia and do dilation, try to wait 12 weeks and dilate to at least two centimeters. Consider pneumatic dilation. Avoid MSA in patients with health-related anxiety or similar functional disorders. And I would also say MSA removal is not the same as MSA failure if the patient's pre-op symptoms and side effects are both resolved. Um, so you can be, um, I would generally, I'm fairly liberal in uh, removing MSAs in patients who are having persistent symptoms and who are unhappy. That's it. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds. That was very comprehensive. Um, and we already have some questions. One, uh, which was already answered, I'll just review, was regarding pH testing. Um, Question was from John King. I normally don't pH test patients with esophagitis given the data regarding the role of nissen in patients with demetrius greater than 50. Do you recommend pH testing for everyone with mild to moderate esophagitis? Dr. Lipham has responded. Um, he said that pH testing does help with determining nissen versus other treatments, but also helps post op if they still have complaints, tries to get it on almost all patients. Uh, and then we have another one. Uh, Dr. Lipum, thank you for your presentation. Patients with severe disease frequently have some degree of abnormality on HRM. Would you recommend Nissen for lower esophageal sphincter augmentation in a patient with log segment Barrett's, some mild dysphagia, high demeester, and an HRM with weak contractility, that is to say a DCI less than 500? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And you know, I don't think we've got clear guidance, despite what I, I showed in the randomized controlled trial and the other publications showing that manometry hasn't been able to predict. I think, you know, I think there is a bar somewhere where if we go below it, I, I think we are going to see increased incidence of dysphagia. We just haven't proven it. 
So it really depends on the degree of dysmotility in that patient. I think if their DCI was somewhere around 500, I would probably err towards doing a Nissen on that patient that's got long segment disease, high Demeester scores, um, because otherwise I think they're going to be at a high rate of failure with really any of the other treatment modalities. And I think that's really the only wheelhouse left for me for a Nissen. You know, again, I, I come from Demeester's program where we did Nissen on anybody that walked through the door, including the cleaning lady, and she didn't even have reflux. So, you know, I've come a long way to now just using it in this one little subset of patients. I don't Dr. know, Jen, you want to chime in? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, if, if a patient has long segment um, Barrett's and some dysphagia already, you know, uh, I think carefully if they if they're um, if they're controlled on PPI, I think that would leave that kind of alone because once you embark on an anti-reflux procedure surgery, there's a foreshort and esophagus. Uh, you know, the, the surveillance may be compromised slightly, um, and and so the recurrence rate is high. So I, I, I'd want to have a good reason now if they're if they're having uh, if they have reached CRIM by ablation and now they, they don't have Barrett's anymore and they're looking for uh, the ability to get off their PPIs, that would be a different category. Um, and, you know, we're looking at collecting data in that subgroup. Um, but a patient with, with a long segment Barrett's that you're not planning on treating, but you want to continue to survey for dysplasia and they have relatively good symptom control on PPI, I, I kind of want to leave it alone. Well, Edgar and I want to jump in too, you know, because I agree with Ken here. And again, this is a surgeon saying this, but you know, you're not going to make a good patient better. And so if they're well controlled on PPIs, and I think the argument or the, the discussion's over, I, I probably wouldn't offer them anything. It's the okay. patient that's not controlled on maximal therapy that wants something else done with severe disease that I might consider a Nissen. But again, don't try to make somebody that's doing great better because it's going to fail. Dr. Reynolds, I see you shaking your head yes. It sounds yeah. like you agree. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree with that 100%. It just depends if their symptoms are controlled would be the main, main thing for me. All right, a couple of other good questions here. This is a great one. Do you consider behavioral referral before MSA placement? Mm, I uh, wish I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, at my, uh, where I was previously, uh, we had a heartburn center and we had a cognitive behavioral therapist and a chiropractor as part of our heartburn center. And mm -hmm. I sent, I had patients who had awful health related anxiety, but they'd seen the billboards and they really wanted a Lynx. And I made them go see the cognitive behavioral therapist first. And, you know, and we had long discussions and then, you know, there were patients who just, because they ended up being more functional than um, actual GERD, we referred out to the chiropractor with anti-inflammatory diets and stuff and the uh, cognitive behavioral therapist. We did a lot of those referrals. Great. Let's see, this is uh, another good one. Since end of flip data suggests that 80% of the benefit is from fixing the hiatus, is there even a role for hiatal hernia repair alone? Ooh, good one. All right. Whoever well, wants to pick that one up. Yeah, I'll take that one because there, you know, there have been a couple of randomized controlled trials looking at that, whether we just go in and fix the hiatal hernia and not do anything else, no fundo. Um, and that across the board fails. Uh, it's not a good operation. Over 50% of those patients had bad esophagitis, very high post-operative Demeester scores. So even though the LES is only 20 to 50% of the problem, it, you need it to stop reflux. And so you, you need to fix both. Dr. Cheng? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, in our experience, there have been patients who wanted to, to stage their anti-reflux. So they'd have a hernia repair and the plan was to do a TIF, you know, uh, after healing for various reasons and COVID happened and there's delay. 
and their reflux comes back after just the hernia repair and, and, and then you've got to start over again. So I totally agree that somehow doing the two combined when, when you do the fun application, it helps the hernia repair. The hernia repair helps the fun application to stay in place because if on the flip side, if you just do a TIF and they really need a hernia repair, you know, the, the sliding nature of the, of the G junction just kind of tears apart your, your fun application. So uh, without a hernia repair, a fun application doesn't hold. Without a, without a fun application, your hernia repair doesn't hold. So the, it's like peanut butter and jelly. They need to come together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was perfect. All right. Um, and this is a good one, just for the evaluation of patients. I'd be interested in the answers from all of you. Are you using Bravo versus 24-hour probe or pH testing? I think the answer is um, catheter versus capsule testing. Bravo for us, probably 98%, 95%. Yeah, yeah. I do Bravo and Bravo off PPIs um, in everyone unless they're purely LPR symptoms, no GERD symptoms, and we're doing a dual probe ambulatory because they, they want it. Yeah, I agree. From the patient experience, you know, I, I interview a lot of patients over the 30 years who've had the entire workup and surgical procedure, and, and I asked them, what was the worst part of the whole thing? <laughs> it was the transnasal pH test. That was the worst <laughs> part of the whole experience. So hands down, patients prefer the wireless and we'll, you know, if the, if the pretest probability is, is high that they've got GERD, 48 hours is fine. But if I want to go the other way and say, well, we don't think you've got GERD, then I'll do 96 hours. Um, now, if they have rumination symptoms and so on, then I'll do the pH impedance, uh, which is really helpful for rumination syndrome. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, there aren't any other active questions, but I have a few. Uh, for each of these procedures, what is the BMI cutoff that you use, if any? Let you go first, Ken. Any BMI <laughs> cutoff for TIF? Yeah, so you know, we we know that uh, high BMIs, you know, BMI greater than thirty, certainly greater than forty, uh, will make GERD uh, more difficult to treat, uh, more refractory, more likely to recur. Um, now, in terms of the actual procedure, the endoscopic approach with TIFF, there's no difference. A BMI of 50, a BMI of 25, inside it looks the same. So it's not an issue of doing it uh, and performing it and creating a nice valve. It's whether that will, uh, that will stick, you know. So um, high BMIs, I would send to our foregut bariatrics team to consider gastric bypass. In, in a patient who uh, is a sleeve candidate with GERD, uh, we're now, we've got a, 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 a clinical trial looking at CTIF prior to sleeve to see if that strategy makes sense. Um, but yeah, it's more the efficacy in the obese patients that, that we were very careful about. So moving target for us with links anyway, um, we just put together a multi-center look at the use of links in higher BMIs greater than 35, expecting that we would see definitely a, a drop off in efficacy in that higher BMI group. Um, and we didn't, there was really no difference in efficacy at all with BMIs up to, I think we were up around 40 to 45. So at this point, I don't know in regards to links fundo, most of the literature would suggest that there's a higher failure rate with Nissen and partial fund applications for BMIs greater than 35. Um, but like I said, with links, I think the jury's out currently anyway. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have an absolute cutoff. And I sort of have this discussion with patients about, you know, what's contributing to your GERD? Is it that you have a hiatal hernia? Is it that you have a weak sphincter? Or is it that you have just a ton of intragastric pressure from your obesity? And if the, if the main driving force of your reflux is your weight, the intragastric pressure, if we do a manometry and you have actually a hypertonic sphincter, a little bit of EGJ outflow obstruction because your sphincter is trying so hard to keep things in there, 
I don't see how putting a links on or MSA on is going to is going to help you. You know, we have to get your intragastric pressure down by doing a bariatric surgery. Whereas if the patient has a hiatal hernia and, you know, then maybe they would benefit from hiatal hernia repair and MSA, or if manometry shows that their sphincter is really weak, then maybe they would at least get some benefit from um, reinforcing that. But we have that discussion and, you know, I, I generally recommend uh, bariatric surgery over BMI 35, but if they're not amenable, um, you know, it's just a discussion then if they understand that they may not completely improve their symptoms or may not improve them at all, you know, I'll you can do it. All right, got another question. Uh, and this is a good one as well. So speaking of transnasal testing and tolerance, what are your next two favorite go-to tests if a patient refuses manometry and do you alter therapy? That's a good one. Hmm. I'll take that one first. So what we do, um, we'll do a dedicated video esophagram protocol. So it's done by a dedicated radiologist. It's both liquid and solid barium. And they do it sort of in the prone oblique position, which is really the most beneficial position to assess motility or clearance of the esophagus. If that looks normal, we'll forego the manometry. If it's abnormal, we won't. And so if that patient refuses to have manometry, we'll offer them an endoscopy sedated and put the catheter down that way, wake them up and have them do their swallows. Most of the time they'll tolerate that. Uh, if they still refuse that, uh, that may be a warning sign um, that maybe that's not a patient we should be intervening on. Um, if they're, the bottom line is if they're barium swallow looks bad and they refuse manometry, I think at that point we usually step back and tell them they're just gonna stay on meds for now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll go next. Uh, so we get a lot of referrals from our surgeons uh, for the pre-surgical uh, workup. And you know historically it was EGD, Bravo, and a separate mano. And the mano was just a deal breaker for for, for workflow, for patient tolerance and all that. Uh, now we're doing EGD Bravo plus endoflip on the same procedure, much better tolerated, much quicker workup, more efficient. And the key thing from our surgeons is just rule out achalasia. We don't care about ineffective esophageal motility as we've talked about today. So just rule out achalasia. And between the endoscopy and, and the endoflip, we're pretty confident of that. Uh, if there's any question, then we, we can do the manometry. And we're doing a lot of endoscopically placed manometry, as John was talking about, and that's uh, more acceptable than manometry by itself. So, but our go-to now is EGD, Bravo, and Oflip. Yeah, I, I'm interested like who's had a uh, manometry done because I was training my new staff and had one done on Friday and it is awful. Like I, I was retching the whole time. I was crying, like my throat hurt for three days. Like you couldn't pay me to ever, ever, ever have that done again. Um, and, and so I definitely understand why patients sometimes can't tolerate it. And, uh, you know, I'm in a community practice and I'm actually in a practice where we have a lot of self-pay patients. And so when we start telling them, um, you know, the price for their EGD, their Bravo and their manometry, they look at, and they say, well, how am I going to pay for the surgery then? So, you know, we, I think are a little more liberal in, in our test lack of testing. So for me though, it really comes down to one symptoms. Do they have any dysphagia? And, and it's taking a really clear history, not just saying, do you, do you have dysphagia? Does food get stuck? But asking, what food do you eat? Are you the first one to finish? Or are you the last one to finish because you chew everything up a hundred times? Because if you don't, you know, it'll get stuck. And you take a good history and they, you know, they really have zero symptoms of dysphagia. I think that there's, you know, Bonavino's group just put out a paper showing, you know, there is no correlation between pre-op findings of IEM and dysphagia symptoms after uh, MSA. And really the only thing that's ever been shown to correlate with dysphagia after MSA is pre-op dysphagia. 
So I think, you know, that's the first thing you want to know is do they have symptoms? And if they don't, then the only other thing I want to know is that they don't have a major motility disorder like achalasia, which I can do with an upper GI generally. All right. That's excellent. Excellent responses, guys. We have another question. This will probably be our last because we've just run over by a few minutes. And I think it's a good one because it's talking about a bit of a diagnostic conundrum. How do you explain EGJ outflow obstruction and a positive demester in the absence of a hiatal hernia? Do you dilate or do you do an anti-reflux procedure? That sounds like a question for Ken. <laughs> yes, go for it. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Uh, so this is an excellent question and one that really requires a, a deeper dive. Uh, because you can have a situation, well, the EGG outflow needs to be further delineated. Is it, is it truly an obstructive situation or is it just a manometric finding? If it's truly obstructive, say based on a time barrier esophagram, uh, then the explanation for the high demister is, is straightforward. They have a few reflux episodes, five, six reflux episodes, but the acid hang time is super long. 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 80 minutes per reflux. So their demister is, is extraordinarily high with relatively few episodes of reflux and they need, uh, they need to be dilated or poemed or pneumatic dilation or something to, uh, to relieve the outflow obstruction uh, or, or a heller. Now, if the EGJ outflow is, is not causing an obstruction, then it could be just reflux related, and then, then they need an anti-reflux procedure. But that's where I'm gonna to defer to John Lipham. No, I agree with you 100%, Ken. I, I think that's exactly it. And that's, I think, what Chicago 4 recommended on that EGJ outflow obstruction is you need a, some other complementary test like a time barium esophagram or endoflip or a barium swallow with a you know, barium pill to see if there's any ha true hang up there. If there's not, then it probably is just a reaction from the reflux causing that finding on manometry. So I, I agree. Dr. Reynolds. Agree. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> all right. Well, We're I think that wraps, tonight. <laughs> yeah, you guys are all on the same page, it seems. All right. Well, that about rounds us out. It's um, just about 8.15. Uh, I thank you all for your insight and expertise tonight and for everyone attending. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'm sure we could be doing this for another two hours, but I think all of us have places to be. So thank you and stay tuned. There will be more of these. We're, we're doing these on about a monthly basis. Um, future topics will be achalasia and gastroparesis. So be sure to tune in. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Uh, Dr. Chang, I yeah. think I'm actually, I'm going to be watching your TIF training M2. Do you do the M2 training for TIF? I do. Yes, I just did the M1. So hey. I'm, yes, I'm going to start using it. Yeah. Yes. I'm, Put I'm more excited. Into your toolbox. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I want to have all the tools in the toolbox. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to start using it. So it'll be good. But I just wanted to say, yes, I'm looking forward to seeing your M2 training session. All right. I'll be extra nervous with you on, on the, <laughs> in the classroom. There. <laughs> Another endorsement for TIFF. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, bye.